Our first speaker today will be Jim Chandler, coming up to talk about skull base chordomas. He's our eminent, eminent skull base surgeon who both, does both open and uh, endoscopic surgery, and he'll take us through his thoughts. Good morning and, and welcome. And first, uh, Dr. Lesniak, I have to tell you, every time I hear you give your introductions and all the wonderful compliments, I, I can't help but blush a little bit, and that's not easy to make me do. So, uh, you know, it's, as Dr. Lesniak said, a, a rare occasion where we get to exchange with, with our patients, and I'm going to do my best to make this more kind of a, a patient-centric and patient-level discussion as opposed to the traditional kind of medical talks that we give. I was asked to minimize the videos and uh, graphic images, but I, I have to tell you, when I meet with patients one-on-one, -on -one, many of them have already seen it online, and uh, they want to see, they want to understand better. So I'll apologize in advance. I do have a couple of videos in my slide set. No uh, disclosures to, to report, and just some general facts that I'm sure you're all familiar with. You know, chordomas are, as Dr. Lesniak alluded to, very rare tumors. They uh, rise from some of the precursor to the skeletal and bony system, notochordal remnants. They represent 0.1 to 0.2 percent of all intracranial tumors, and 1 to 4 percent of skeletal tumors, the vast majority of those, of course, being in the spinal column. The incidence is 0.08 per 100,000, and the prevalence is less than one per 100,000. So as Dr. Lesniak mentioned, it's, it's quite unique that we have so many patients and people uh, otherwise affected by, by chordoma here in this, this room today. And just real quick, are there any of my patients in the room, just so I'm, uh, yes, okay. There's a slight male predominance with the ratio of male to female of 1.6 to 1, and the pink incidence is somewhere between the fourth and the fifth decade. The uh, vast majority of the skull base chordomas are going to be in the clival bone, and they represent a little less than one-third of all chordomas. So the, the reason that, uh, you know, JP and I are so passionate about this is because it's really important that, in particular early on, the best surgical resection is, is achieved. And that can be done either in an open fashion, or as I'll briefly discuss, in a more minimally invasive or endoscopic fashion. In situations where we're unable to completely remove a tumor, all of these patients should go on to radiation and uh, Dr. Sajtev and, and Gandhi will, will speak to that, and I'll briefly discuss some of the mild controversy that exists with regard to should radiation be done after a gross total resection. When I was a, in training, uh, most of the chordoma patients were felt to have, with skull base lesions, were felt to have an inoperable condition because there was no good way to actually get to that area of the, of the skull, of the brain, safely. So many of them were referred on for, for radiation, in particular, you know, proton beam when, when it could be accessed. But subsequent to my training, there were a lot of very unique and novel approaches that were designed by uh, many of our leaders to kind of get us safe access to the area where these chordomas occur. Is there an arrow on here so that there's no arrow? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult area 
to access. This is another view of the clivus. So it's this bone right down here, really in the middle of the head. So a variety of interesting open approaches uh, developed in the past 15, 20 years that included removal of the forehead, removal of this band of bone, the eyes and the, above the eyes and the nose. Uh, one of my formerly favorite ways to remove these, removal of bone from the side of the head and the, the cheekbone. All of these giving good access to that clival bone right in the center at the base of the skull. Another of my formerly favorite operations was to make an incision above the teeth line and split the maxilla and go straight back to the clivus. And then this is a procedure that Dr. Walensky and I do where we can go through the mouth and split the mandible, move the tongue over. And uh, as you can tell, you know, many of these procedures are fairly extensive, invasive. Uh, there's a morbidity associated with just doing the exposure, which is why we began to consider alternative, less invasive strategies. And so building on what our rhinology colleagues had done, utilizing an endoscope to access all the sinus cavities, we began to explore using an endoscope to get to the various corridors of the skull base, including here, the frontal lobe, this area here around the pituitary gland, and this area here, which is the clivus. But, you know, regardless of the approach, the goals are, are all the same. You want to achieve uh, maximum exposure to do a safe operation. And the ultimate goal is uh, preservation of a, a good quality of life. And whether it be open or endoscopic, that's the priority. The endoscope is, uh, if, you, if you look at this slide here, this is uh, one I like to show to kind of help people understand what the endoscope brings to the table. This is uh, a church in uh, Sao Paulo. I'm looking out of a window, and in the distance, you can see what occurs with the microscope. It gets you a good closer view, but for more definition, it's, it's really the endoscope that gets you in around corners the, the trade-off is it's monocular view, meaning you lose a little depth perception, which can make it a little more challenging to control bleeding issues and to reconstruct the base of the skull. So I want to show a couple of illustrative cases, the first being this young girl. She was 16. She came in with double vision, which, as many of you know, is one of the common presenting symptoms of chordoma. And she had the, the lesion that you see here. So this is where the clivus is, and there's this. Can everybody in the room see what I'm pointing to? Okay. There's this, this bright lesion here on this sequence, and then if you look at this side view right in here. And so it was our sense that the most straightforward way to do it would be to come in through the nose and use the endoscope and take this lesion out. Okay, and so this is a video of what we see once we've gotten into the nasal cavity. So we've, we've come straight back and we've gotten to the sinus cavity here. And now we're drilling out the bone. One of the nice things about the endoscopic approach is to get to the lesion, you have to drill out oftentimes all the involved bone. And in particular for dural or intradural lesions, you have to take out the dura, which is sometimes very difficult to do from an open strategy. And so this is just showing this tumor which has kind of a mixed consistency, some parts calcified, some parts gelatinous, being pilled out. And this membrane you see here is the dura matter. It's that membrane that lines the brain and the, and the, and the, and the spinal column. And so 
The big question is whether this is piercing the dura and going right up against the, the brain stem. And fortuitously, it, it was not. And so we're able to scrape all of this out, take out all the involved bone. And this is the end result. And this was her post-operative MRI, which shows that the, the tumor is gone. And she went home the next day. And this young lady has uh, completed college, grad school. She's about 11 years out now, doing really well. This gentleman similarly presented with double vision, and he had the scan that you see here, which shows in the same general vicinity this fairly complex lesion. However, this one looked a little bit more ominous in that this, 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 this structure here is the basilar artery. It's one of the more important blood vessels in the brain. And it was completely displaced, potentially encased by this, and there was some pressure on this structure here, which is the brain stem. But similarly, we, we felt that this was a, a good case to be addressed endoscopically. And so now we're, we've gone through the sinus cavity and we're drilling out bone. That's that dural membrane that we talked about. And now we're gonna work down to the clivus and systematically uh, debulk this tumor. And what we found is that the tumor had invaded the dura matter. You can see how thickened it is. And we're gonna cut out all that involved tumor, and this is that, that artery. And so, if the tumor is soft enough, we can take it off of that artery safely. If it's firm and rubbery, there's not a lot that we can do. In this case, it was fairly soft, and so, over the course of several hours, with a rhinologist holding that scope as I work, we peeled the tumor off that artery, off the brain stem, and then did a reconstruction. The reconstruction tends to be a lot more important in situations where we've removed that dura matter because there's a big hole at the base of the brain. And this was his post-operative scan. He went home in approximately four days and he's been disease-free for five years. This, this last case that I want to present is a gentleman who came in with headaches, difficulty with eye movements, and difficulty breathing. And I think you can see why he had difficulty breathing. This was his chordoma. So not only did it involve the clivus, but it grew down into the hard and soft palate and was obstructing his airway. And so he could barely breathe. And so we took him to surgery fairly urgently and decompressed primarily the, the airway obstruction issue and had decided that we would stage him and do the, the second half, the more difficult part at a later time. Uh, but when he came back, this uh, tumor, and this was only a few months, had significantly grown. So we knew we were gonna have a challenging situation on our hands. We took him to surgery again and to the point I made on the last case, it's all about the consistency of the tumor. This was a very firm, rubbery tumor. And so the best we could do was a partial resection or a subtotal resection with the idea being that we'll send them off for radiation afterwards. And after a six week period or so, you see he's already had some regrowth. And so we sent him to uh, Dr. Gandhi and his team and they performed proton beam radiation, and you can see it had a very dramatic effect. And uh, he did well for about three years, and then he had a significant recurrence, which happens in a very small subset of patients. In general, the, the patients who do best are ones who are able to achieve a gross total resection. And that's why it's so important to identify, find the procedure that will allow you the best chance at removing the most. So there have been some studies looking at open versus endoscopic approaches and what provide the best result. This is a meta-analysis, which is a collection of articles from a variety of sources. And this was articles collected, articles published between 1950 and, and 2010. 
There were 37 studies, almost 800 patients. And their key findings were that there was a significantly higher percentage of gross total resection, 61% versus 48% in patients who underwent an endoscopic resection. So the significance there is not every center does endoscopic surgery. And as you advise individuals who reach out to you about what type of surgery should they have, it's important that they ask, do you do endoscopic surgery? Because it might be a situation where a better and more complete resection can be achieved. There were fewer complications as it related to the cranial nerves, which control the eye movements and so forth. There were fewer incidences of infections, such as meningitis. Fewer patients succumbed to their disease. There was a lesser incidence of recurrence in that same general vicinity of the surgery. There was no significant difference in the incidence of spinal fluid leak, which is one of the big challenges with endoscopic surgery, as we talked about. And in, maybe two years ago, we, we published our experience with endoscopic surgery. And uh, believe it or not, at 17 patients, this was at the time perhaps the third largest series in the literature. And the, the key finding was that we were able to achieve a gross total resection in about 53% of our patients with a mean follow-up of 63 months. There were a total of 13 recurrences, and that was in, in five patients. And the, of the patients who had gross total resection, there was only one recurrence, whereas patients who had the subtotal resection, as, as we talked about in the last case I presented, there was about a 75% recurrence. One of the individuals who I, I did some specialty training with uh, is, has the world's largest experience in open surgery, it's Dr. Shekhar, and he and his group uh, reviewed the, the world literature uh, in 2011. And some of the key findings that, that I want to highlight, so there were 23 studies, 807 patients with a mean age of 51, average follow-up of 53.6 years. There was a, a wide range of extensive resection, zero to 73 uh, percent. The five-year progression-free survival, meaning there was no evidence of recurrence for five years, and somewhere between 50 to 15 to 80 percent of patients with the average of 50 percent. The five-year overall survival percentage was somewhere between 61 and 100 percent, or 79. There were uh, 11 groups that received photon-based radiotherapy, nine groups received proton beam, six groups gamma knife, three groups carbon ion. And the five-year progression-free survival was 87% versus 50% in situations where they were able to achieve a uh, complete resection as opposed to a subtotal. And the five year, 95 versus 71. So again, speaking to the importance of making sure uh, patients are at a center where a gross total resection can potentially be achieved. The, I'm gonna skip ahead because I'm running short on time. One of the interesting uh, findings was that in situations where there was a gross total resection, and when I was with Dr. Shaker, if he achieved a gross total resection, he would not refer patients on to radiation. Uh, he found that there was no significant difference in the progression-free or oral survival, whether adju adjuvant or post-surgical radiation was given um, in situations where there had been a gross total resection. So I, I, I say that in part to stimulate the dialogue that Dr. Sajdev and Dr. Gandhi will be having. We looked at our experience with, with surgery and radiation, and I'll just skip to a, our conclusion. And our conclusion was that the radiation uh, did make a, a difference. And so uh, what was remarkable about our study was that we found no difference between adjuvant proton beam versus Gamma knife, and I don't know if Dr. Gandhi will address that, but 
obviously from a patient experience, to undergo the, the standard course of proton beam is a bit more onerous than a single session of, of, of gamma knife. So although many studies have shown that the use of radiation uh, to have minimal benefit after a gross total resection, our, our studies seem to suggest otherwise with the median survival of 11.3 years. So I'll conclude with you know, the best treatment paradigm for skull-based surgery is a gross total resection, and it's important that uh, patients are offered a chance for a complete resection. The, the patients that come to us who've had surgery elsewhere or had radiation in lieu of surgery are the ones who tend not to do as well. So a gross total resection plus or minus radiation uh, certainly if it's a subtotal resection, radiation, proton beam, or gamma knife, or photon therapy is reasonable. Uh, I think I showed that the endoscopic, the minimally invasive strategy, can be very effective in the right situation. And as with, with anything that we do as, as surgeons, it's all about experience, and so it's important to be at a center where the, the, the surgical team has the experience as Dr. Walensky and myself, Dr. Lesniak have. The, the biggest challenge with that endoscopic procedure that you will read about and that you will hear about is that reconstruction of the, of the skull base and spinal fluid leakage tends to be one of our, our major considerations. Now, I have to leave shortly and I'm gonna deviate a little bit from the, the plan and fill any questions related to skull base surgery at this time. Yes, sir. How common is an intradural penetration with a tumor, a tumor? Uh, I'd say over 50% of the ones that, that I presented in our series had intradural penetration. Any other questions? Well, great. Thank you for your attention. Wait, one, one, one quick question. <laughs> Just a real quick question. You talked about the benefits of endoscopic surgery on clival chordomas. Is, would there be perceived any benefit from this type of treatment for other types of chordoma? So I'll touch base with the, the I'll talk to you about that during when, when I talk about mobile spine and sacrum right now. Great, thank you all. All right, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit and go down the spine. So, um, you know, in, in brain surgery, we always think of the head as the most important thing, but I'm a brain surgeon and I think of the spine as the most important thing. So we're gonna talk about the mobile spine, which essentially talks about C1 through L5 and the sacrum. So just a, this is a, I always thought it was a new slide because I got it off our website from Northwestern, but you can see where we are right here. This is the ability lab being built this is that research facility right across the street, not even there. So this must be at least five years old, that slide, but hopefully that's the, one of the only old slides. So, you know, when we talk about chordomas uh, of the mobile spine and sacrum, it's a little bit different than when we talk about uh, clival chordomas, just because of what we can do from a surgical perspective is a little bit broader, okay? When we talk about our goals, and this is really the truth with the clavicordomas as well, but our goal is cure or long-term survival. I actually don't like the word cure because um, I'm very superstitious, so I don't want to jinx us, right? And so um, the only way I can say cure is if, you know, we passed on from something else, right? And so I always tell my patients that we're going to follow along with each other forever uh, until you guys get sick of me, whichever, whichever comes first here, okay? As you guys know, our adjuvant therapies with chordomas are very limited, right? We try different chemotherapies. We're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Dr. Stoop and Dr. Park about the chemotherapeutic options, but it, so far it's been very limited. Our radiation therapy options are fairly limited as well. I mean, we have great techniques now with proton beam, carbon ion, adjuvants such as stereotactic radiosurgery, but it's still very limited as what we can achieve with just that. 
And so what we found in the mobile spine and sacrum, first in the sacrum before mobile spine, is that if we have an on block resection, and you've taken that tumor in one piece, we have the best chance of disease-free survival or potential cure. When we look at this, this is an old paper from MD Anderson back in 1999 when Julie York was a fellow looking at uh, these chordomas of the sacrum, that if we had, at that time we called them radical excisions, uh, which is a mixture of on block resections and just uh, really aggressive in subtotal resections, that the more aggressive you were with the surgery, the best chance the patient had for disease-free survival. Stefano Boriani in Italy had the same description with mobile spine chordomas and found that on block resection gave these patients the best chance for cure and long term survival. And those with interlesional resection had uh, worsening outcomes. We found the same thing when we looked at our sacral chordoma series that uh, looking at the patients where the intent to treat was to get an on block resection, if we looked at those specimens from the pathologist and if there was a contaminated margin, those patients had a a less opportune chance of long-term survival and cure compared to those that had negative margin resection. So just a couple of terms that are thrown around. You guys are probably more sophisticated than most audiences I've talked to about this because most people don't know anything about chordoma. People with chordomas know most everything about them. But the term spondylectomy, okay, we use this quite a bit, it really refers to removing a segment of the spine. Okay, That's actually not the on-block technique. The on-block technique is talking about how we're getting around the tumor itself. I mean, we could, I guess we could remove a segment of the spine in one piece, but that would mean taking the spinal cord out, which we don't do. But an on-block resection talks about taking out the tumor in one piece. And there are different definitions within this in the oncology world, talking about wide, marginal, and then there's this term that gets thrown out there called planned transgression. So a wide margin is generally having a, taking out the entire compartment that that tumor comes from and taking at least a centimeter of healthy tissue around that tumor. In the spine and sacrum, we actually never do that because in order to take out the entire compartment, you'd have to have a small distal chordoma that's not a touching a nerve root and take out the entire sacrum and sacrifice all those roots, which nobody in their right mind would want to have done. So our best resections are marginal on block resections, meaning that we get the tumor all out in one piece but the closest margin will be at the capsule of the tumor. Okay, and then intralesional tumor resections are when we can actually get into the tumor. So all of our clival resections are gonna be intralesional resections because there's no way that we can take those tumors out in one piece without exceptional morbidity. So in the clivus, we have to do an intralesional resection. In the spine and, and sacrum, we can try to get an on block resection or taking that tumor out in one piece. Now, when we do this, we think about these tumors, about how are we going to get this tumor out in one piece, okay? So the MRI scan on the uh, left-hand side, you can see the, the tumor right here involving the vertebral body and going into the epidural space. This is an MRI where you're looking at from the side where this is the spinal cord, the white is the spinal fluid, this is the front of the spine, the back of the spine, and this is the, the white here is the chordoma. And here, this is a axial cut or cross-sectional cut, back of the spine, front of the spine, spinal cord's right here, and the tumor is the white that's pushing back towards the spinal cord. So if we want to take this out in one piece, we need to cut above the tumor, below the tumor, to the sides of the tumor, and somehow create a corridor so we can move this tumor away from the spinal cord to protect the spinal cord so that this person has a nice functional outcome besides having the tumor taken out because taking the tumor out and having somebody not being able to be functional is not what our goals are. So when we think about these different approaches, we need to understand what kind of sacrifices need to be made to get these tumors out and what kind of sacrifices the patient's going to have to go through to have those taken out and whether or not they really want to go through this, right? In the cervical spine, we have to think about the vertebral arteries. These are large blood vessels that go through the spine and feed the back portion of our brain. Along the spine and the thoracic spine are segmental vessels, which are the vessels that come off the aorta and feed the spinal cord. Many times we can take those vessels, but there's a limited number of them we can take before people have vascular issues with their spinal cord. There are nerve roots. Some are sacrificable that people don't really notice that much of a difference with. 
but others are very critical. And the cervical spine in particular, our nerves for our breathing, our arms movement, our hand movement are very critical. And so we try to spare those as much as possible in order to make people have functional outcomes. And then in the sacrum, there are very important nerves that go for our bowel and bladder and sexual function that are very critical for understanding where these are and how to preserve them if possible and, and what the sacrifices will be if we need to take them out. Because unfortunately, if we transgress this tumor, if we don't take the tumor out in one piece, these nerves will disappear later when that tumor comes back. And so it's, it's really an investment from a patient perspective of deciding what you're willing to go uh, sacrifice up front in order to get this tumor out, okay? This is a, a beautiful drawing from Ian Sook, one of our illustrators that we had when I was in Baltimore. And, and you can see this is kind of a, a look from the front to the back. The sacrum is right here. This is the rectum. And then these are the nerves that come around from the sacrum that f feed to the rectum and the bladder to control our bowel and bladder function. So the S2, S3, and S4 nerve roots are the ones that are very important for this region. And so when we take out part of the sacrum that might be involved in tumor, we're trying to spare these new nerves as much as possible. And we can predict very well what those outcomes will be based on our experience with sacrificing these nerve roots. And so a classification scheme that came up with to describe this was a way so that we could discuss this better with patients about what they can expect after a surgery. So we called these uh, sacral amputations low, mid, high, and total sacrectomy. And then we have this other category called hemicorporectomy or functional hemicorporectomy. What that means is if we are able to spare the S2 and the S3 nerve roots on both sides, that person's going to have normal bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Even though S4 nerve root does go to that, for whatever reason, we can sacrifice that nerve root, it doesn't change things. And that's what we call low sacral amputation. If we have to sacrifice the S3 nerve root on both sides, that's called a mid sacral amputation. What that means from a patient outcome is that we'll have some bowel, bladder, and sec uh, sexual function, but it won't be normal, okay? If we do a high sacral amputation, those nerves have to be sacrificed, and then you lose the bowel, bladder, and sexual function. That's what we call high sacral amputation, and the S2, 3, and 4 nerve roots are sacrificed during that time. The other thing that happens, though, is you still have some of that bone of S1 there, so patients with this problem don't need to have necessarily a reconstruction with screws and rods to hold the pelvis together. When we have a total sacrectomy, that's taking the entire sacrum out, where essentially all those nerves are sacrificed, but also the pelvis is no longer joined up with the spine. And then we need a reconstruction with rods and screws to hold things together. A hemicorporectomy, or a functional hemicorporectomy, is essentially, uh, and I'm not an advocate of this, but essentially taking off the lower part of the body. And obviously then, there's no function in that area and you're disconnected. So, Obviously, it's a lot of sacrifice to undergo one of these operations. And so if somebody says that they have a chordoma, I say that you need to prove it before you undergo one of these operations, okay? In the clivus, we, we don't prove it ahead of time. We don't get a biopsy to prove that that's the chordoma because the operation is gonna be an intralesional operation. It is gonna be a biopsy at the time, and there's not the option for a very aggressive open on block resection in that situation. But here there is. And we don't want to put anybody through one of these resections if they have something that actually looks like a chordoma, but something else. And so I've seen that in several instances where somebody sent to me as a chordoma, we get the biopsy, and it turns out to be multiple myeloma, lung cancer, some other tumor that needs to be treated in a different way, and they don't need this kind of an operation. They need something different. When we get a biopsy, though, people are always worried about seeding that area, seeding the tissue around that area with tumor, and then somebody can become un incurable with that. So how we do the biopsy is key. We want to have a transsacral route of biopsy, meaning coming from the back side, either through the sacrum or just off midline, so that at the time of surgery, we can cut out that skin and tissue where the biopsy went through to make sure that all those cells are gone. We don't want to have a biopsy that comes in from the side like this because it makes it nearly impossible to get that entire tissue out without having a lot more sacrifice. Or 
what used to be done, sometimes still is, but most people are getting much better and more sophisticated, and I don't mean the patients, I mean the physicians, people would do a transrectal biopsy because when you do a rectal exam, you can feel this tumor, and it seems so obvious to get a biopsy that way, but then you contaminate the whole uh, rectum, and then, you, and then you're stuck. Now, with, the new, with our needle technology nowadays, that are double lumen uh, needles, the chance of spillage is very small, but we try to minimize it as much as possible. Um, this doesn't project very well, because I, I have the windows open, but I don't want to close the windows, because it's so beautiful outside. But this is a, a patient with a chordoma at L2, but he also has little spots lower down, these little white spots. And to, to biopsy those, we can't do it with a needle. It had to be done open. And these, this actually is a patient with multicentric uh, chordoma in multiple different levels. Exceptionally rare. Chordoma is rare in itself, one in a million, but this is even, I don't know, like hen's teeth, even more rare. And, you know, you can get a whole bunch of pathologists and neurosurgeons in a room that deal with chordoma and will debate back and forth what this actually is. Is this multicentric chordoma or is this a chordoma with notochordal rest at all the different levels? In the end, we called it notochordal rest at different levels um, and didn't progress this lesion, but it's kind of a little bit of semantics. When the tumor is contained within the bone, we call it a notochordal rest. When it starts to expand beyond it, we call it more of a chordoma. So, as Dr. Chandler talked about, we, when, we, when we approach tumors of this kind, we want to have patients go to centers of excellent, where, excellence where people have experience doing these kind of operations. And I'll just share with you my experience of, of mobile spine and sacral uh, resections for on block resections. So these, these are patients that all came for on block resections. For chordoma, obviously, we see patients that have to have an interlesional resection for other reasons. Maybe they have recurrences or in their other areas with, uh, that can't be taken out in one piece. But this is purely looking at the on block resections. So, in my experience, I've had 85 patients where we've had on block resections uh, for them. And looking at the levels of the spine where these happen, I think a lot of this is referral patterns, but the majority you can see happen in the sacral region and less so in the mobile spine. The cervical spine is the most rare, and I have seen chordomas at the C1 level, but none of them, I think, can be taken out in one piece without really hurting somebody. So that's why there's nobody who has non block resection at C1. And this is just uh, looking at it a little bit bigger. So how do we think about these uh, different operations? How do we do it? I'm going to just take you through two uh, examples. This is a patient with a chordoma in the mid-thoracic spine. This, the white is the tumor. This is the back of the spine, front of the spine. Aorta, the big vessel that takes all of our blood from our heart to distribute it. And then these are the lungs on either side. So this is approached through a single stage operation coming from the back of the spine. We expose the spine and the ribs on either side. We actually remove the ribs on either spot and side and do a laminectomy to expose the spinal cord so we can create a corridor to protect the spinal cord and deliver this tumor away. Then we're going to dissect around the spine from the back, pushing the aorta and the lungs out of the way so we can protect these things. And at the time of this illustration, we would actually put a retractor there to protect all these uh, wonderful tissues. And then uh, with a special saw that I developed, we would cut the spine. It's kind of like using a giggly saw, but it's a special saw that has diamonds encrusted on it with a pulley system so we can cut the spine, protecting both the aorta and fibra vena cava and the spinal cord cutting side to side. And then the tumor comes out, and then it gets reconstructed with something in the front, like a cage, and rods and screws in the back. And this is the specimen as it comes out. This is actually, the cut is here and here, so this is the tumor part of it, and this is the non-tumor part of it. This is where the spinal cord is. And then this is what the reconstruction looks like on x-ray. Moving down the spine to our sacral chordomas. This is a large sacral chordoma that, this, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to laser works. This here is the L5 S1 disc space. This is the L5 bone, or S1 bone. The tumor comes out of here and actually is filling the entire pelvic region up to the L5 S1 disc space. So in order for this tumor to come out, this requires a total sacrectomy. Um, when most people read about total sacrectomies, how we used to do this 
was in a two-stage operation, meaning coming from the front of the spine first, or going to the pelvis, to mobilize the disc space, the L5-S1, mobilize the rectum out of the way. Sometimes we would um, bring some tissue in there from a plastic surgery point of view, uh, what we call a vertical rectus flap, put it in the belly, and then come from a second stage operation posteriorly, remove the tumor, reconstruct the spine, and have the plastic surgeons close everything up. Um, starting about, now I'm dating myself, probably about 13 years ago, we started developing this operation for taking this tumor all out from one direction, all from a posterior approach, so that we can minimize some of the morbidity that patients have to go through. So rather than two operations, one operation. Sometimes there's a large tissue defect, so we have to go to the front first so the plastic surgeons can get a, a flap, but we're, it's less of an involved operation than it used to be. Also, people read about colostomies and things like that. In my experience, we've been able to do this operation without having to do colostomies. People do have difficulty, obviously, with the bowel bladder function, but with uh, physical therapy and training through rehab, many patients can figure out how to deal with this problem on their own with suppositories and dealing with this so that they can be socially clean and, and have a, a semi-normal life as far as that goes to avoid the colostomy. How this operation goes is that essentially we need to expose the nerve roots that we're going to protect, cut the disc at L5-S1, cut the ilium, which is the part of the pelvis, so that the sacrum can be mobile, and then bring the entire specimen posteriorly and dissect the rectum and the great vessels away from the tumor in the front, delivering the specimen out. And then after all this is done, we need to put the person back together so they can be functional, right? Because otherwise their spine and legs and are all disconnected, so then we use rods and screws and lots of graph material to try to hold things together. And then our plastic surgeons um, bring tissue into that area to try to get everything to heal as best as possible. Now these surgeries are very large surgeries and we've had lots of different learning experiences over the years and how to deal with this. And so this is actually a slide from one of the Cordoma meetings we had back in 2008 when uh, I think Josh asked me to talk about the future of spine surgery or something like that with Cordoma, or so future of Cordoma surgery. And there, is a lot of change, there are a lot of changes that have happened over the years that have made these things possible, okay? So when I was in training, our spinal implants were hooks and rods, so we couldn't do these complex reconstructions like we have now. We would do them, but they wouldn't hold up very well. And then screws came into play. We moved from stainless steel to titanium, so MRI images got better. Cages are, are the things that look like a little miniature car jacks that we can reconstruct the spine. Came, came about, they're made out of uh, titanium, and later they became made, made out of something called PEAK, which is a pharmaceutical plastic. Allows imaging to be better from an MRI perspective. But as patients, many of my patients have experienced, unfortunately this hardware, it's very strong, but it's not durable for life. Our bodies are stronger than any metal we can put into our bodies because this stuff wears out. And so just like if you take a paper clip, wiggle it around, you'll be able to break that thing take one of these big titanium rods and wiggle it around, if you could do it for several years without stopping, you probably could break it. I don't think anybody can do that, but they can do, but it's happening in your body. What we're trying to ask your body to do is to grow bone to heal, because that's essentially stronger than any sort of metal we can put in there. But we're asking a lot of your body to do that, so not everybody can do that, and it can take many, many years to do that. And so these rods and, and screws fatigue and break. But back in 2008, we were talking about potential of using something like carbon fiber or something like that in the spine for reconstructing the spine because that would be stronger potentially than titanium. And at that time, it was sort of a dream. Recently, just about two months ago, the FDA approved a carbon fiber pedicle screw system. So now it is possible for people with cordoma to get these implants. They're very fidgety, and I used one of these sets the other day, and it takes many, many more hours than regular. But it is an opportunity for things to be better. Okay. What it also allows people to do is that we have these peak cages that are plastic. So they're more um, better visualized on MRI scan than the metal ones. With carbon fiber, then, you'll have less imaging issues, so we can look at post-operative MRI scans better for seeing if tumors are coming back. And also, if we have to have radiation therapy, like from what Dr. Gandhi is going to talk about and Dr. Sachev, 
we don't have any interference from the uh, hardware blocking some of the proton beam radiation pathways. So it allows us to think about things in different ways. So I'm going to just end there. And just uh, this slide didn't come out very well, but this is essentially our team for Cordoma, involving all the different specialties. So uh, unfortunately, all these different uh, physicians get called by me usually about two weeks ahead of time and say, hey, are you available on this day for this day and this day? And we try to coordinate all these different people and Lily and Lola, my nurses back there, pull their hair out trying to get these people to be all on the same day at the same time and show up. But we make it happen and so that we can pull off these kind of operations. So I'm going to complete there. And then I think our next speaker is, is it Benai? Benai is uh, our proton beam specialist. Vinay is our proton beam specialist, um, and the proton beam is, is out in Warrenville, which is like a, an hour from here, something like that. Um, but it covers this entire Illinois area, and I guess actually several states around it as far as uh, treatment centers. Because I do protons, it make me technical. Um, how's that? Hello? Hey, we made it. Closer to the top. You know, I, uh, I always tell my patients that I, I learn uh, more from them than they learn from me. Uh, this is another example. Um, and uh, let's try this right here. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm honored and humbled to be able to speak in front of all of you um, and to be such a, a partner with the Cordoma Foundation. As I mentioned, I learned more from my patients than they learned from me, and that is because it was the, my patients who actually brought the Cordoma Foundation to my attention. Uh, you know, we treat quite a few Cordomas at the Northwestern Proton Center. We average about 15 a year. Uh, and I had not heard about it until my patients brought it to my attention, talked to me about a Facebook page that I was not privy to. Uh, and uh, it was really enlightening. And since then, we've had a tremendous partnership and collaboration that we looked forward to continuing to grow moving forward. I think what you're seeing today, this morning, is a tremendous amount of passion. Uh, passion that you all share for helping your loved ones or yourselves in terms of overcoming this journey or walking through this journey of Cordoma. Passion from a lot of uh, physicians uh, who've dedicated their lives to trying to improve outcomes for patients with Cordomas. Uh, I'm going to share my passion as it relates to radiotherapy, but also recognize that there is so much we don't know and so much we have yet to learn, uh, but there are continued advances. So I want to speak a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in that respect. So I have no disclosures. So this is a, you've seen this image in the prior um, talks. This is a clivocordoma post-surgery. Uh, and in the uh, red and blue is my target that I define in terms of the area that I need to treat with radiotherapy. And the challenge is it's in what I like to call high-priced real estate. Uh, so there's the brain stem behind, the temporal lobes on both sides, and above it, uh, the optic nerves and chiasms. So it's kind of like being on the 18th fairway and trying to get the ball right on the green between uh, a sand trap, uh, water, and some woods. Um, and so that becomes a very challenging situation. And so within radiotherapy, we have a tremendous, we've seen a tremendous advance in technology over the last several decades that is allowing us, in fact, over the last several years, that is allowing us to land that ball right on that green as much as possible. So how does radiotherapy work on chordomas? Radiotherapy, when we deliver radiotherapy, we are essentially depositing uh, DNA damage to the tumor cells. And the challenge is that we don't necessarily inflict tumor cell death right away. Instead, we require that chordoma cell to try to divide before that DNA damage causes that tumor cell to die. So essentially, radiotherapy, what it does is it stunts tumors. It can shrink some tumors, and Dr. Chandler showed a very nice picture, post-protons of a shrinkage, but we don't usually see that. We stunt tumors. So to the point that Dr. Chandler, Dr. Walensky mentioned, um, it is so critically important to have very good surgery up front. Because after that, we are left to treat 
whatever's left, including my preference to treat microscopic disease. That gives us the best opportunity to provide control of tumor because that's what radiotherapy does. It stunts tumors. So you guys have seen this slide, there's various different uh, types of chordoma, clivus, uh, mobile spine, and sacral. You know, my general bias, and I recognize there's still some controversy, but my general bias is um, unless a patient has had a true on block resection, where I, as a radiation oncologist, feel comfortable that all of that tumor has been removed wide margins, uh, I'd see there's a role for radiotherapy. And this becomes a challenge, as Dr. Walensky mentioned, for instance, in the clivus, uh, where it is typically we define a gross total resection as removing what we see on the MRI, but we all know that there's more infiltrative tumor beyond that. Uh, sometimes in the sacrum, we see the same thing. When Dr. Walensky's extraordinarily talented hands, when he gets a very nice on block resection, then we feel comfortable after that to say, look, we got, uh, we got everything. There's no role for radiotherapy. There's nothing for us to stunt. Maybe we can watch. There's a very interesting paper that was published uh, last year where they actually looked at patients who underwent sacrectomies for sacral chordomas uh, and then actually looked at their pathologic assessment. And in their on block resection that they performed, they actually included some of the gluteal musculature around and behind the sacrum. And they found, interestingly, what we call micro skip mats. So here is a, a tumor in the sacrum, and here's another skip mat 17 millimeters away in the muscle of the, of the, of the gluteus musculature. So this is kind of what we tend to see, unfortunately. It's the sense that you know, these tumors, and I'm always humbled by chordomas because of how truly infiltrative they can be beyond what we can see on an MRI. And sometimes it's a, sort of a guesstimate. Okay, Dr. Walensky, do you really feel like you got it all? I rely, I trust you to tell me you feel like you got it all. But in certain situations, if you feel there's any concern that there is microscopic skip mats or elsewhere, we need to think about how we incorporate radiotherapy. And the key, and I'm going to talk about this, is radiotherapy needs to not just be accurately delivered, it needs to be broadly delivered. We need to treat all microscopic skip mats, all microscopic infiltration, so that tumor doesn't come back. So this is a figure from where they talk about the micro skip mats and they see it up to two centimeters, 20 millimeters away from where the bone was into the gluteal musculature. The other challenge we face in radiotherapy is that chordomas are inherently relatively radio resistant in the sense that we require escalated radiotherapy dose to optimize long-term control. The higher the dose we treat, the more likely we are to stunt that tumor and control over the long term. So how do we achieve that? Well, the challenge when we achieve that is that, again, we're in high-priced real estate. So in a clival chordoma, if we're trying to escalate the dose to high doses, we're actually exceeding what the normal tissues can tolerate around that area, brainstem, optics, temporal lobes. So how do we escalate radiotherapy? Well, this is a very broad sort of brush on radiotherapy. So there are two major types of radiotherapy. is radiosurgery and fractionated radiotherapy. Radiosurgery is the delivery as of a single high-dose radiation treatment or three high-dose radiation treatments to an area, whereas fractionated radiotherapy is the delivery of multiple smaller aliquots of radiation over the course of eight-plus weeks of treatment, with the cumulative dose being a high total dose. The challenge with radiosurgery is because we're delivering such a high dose in a single treatment, we can only do so to a small volume, uh, which uh, it has to be very well defined. Fractionated radiotherapy allows us to treat a more larger volume that is more well infiltrative because we're treating it in smaller aliquots every day. So here are the approaches to chordoma radiosurgery. We use gamma knife radiosurgery, uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy. Uh, for fraction radiotherapy, we think about protons and IMRT, and I'll talk about the differences in a little bit. One of the biggest challenges we face in chordomas is the limited literature that we have, and that's because it's such a rare tumor. So we rely on the best available evidence that we can compile. You know, we had a wonderful dinner, and I was fortunate to have a great dinner with some of the Cordoma board members and Josh and all the staff last night, and we were talking about, okay, we've got to get some better data pulled together, and this is kind of some of the challenges. But this is, in my opinion, one of the better available papers regarding radiotherapy modality. It was a meta-analysis of 25 studies and up to 1,000 patients uh, looking at what are the differences in survival, timeline of a, of a chordoma survivor using conventional x-ray radiotherapy, radiosurgery or stereotactic body radiotherapy, proton therapy, and carbon ion therapy. So anything that has a p-value less than 0.05 for, for the non-statisticians is considered significantly different. So one difference is proton therapy was better than conventional x-ray therapy, and why is that the case? 
Well, conventional X-ray therapy uses megavoltage X-rays to, to deliver radiation. And it's essentially like a flashlight, where it diverges as it approaches the target, it bathes it in a radiation dose, and then it keeps going all the way through. And really, the only thing we can control with X-ray radiation are the sides of our beams. We put in uh, leaves or collimators or blocks to try to control the sides. And so when we summate that, we try to shape the high dose to the target. With intensity modulated radiotherapy, we're bringing in flashlights from all around the patient. But each one is just essentially just controlling the sides, and we're trying to sculpt the dose to that target. Protons are different. Protons are a particle. So they allow us to not just sculpt the sides or shape the sides, but they also stop in a finite place. So we now have a third dimension that we can control and allows us to better shape the tumor. But really, the greatest benefit of proton therapy for chordomas is when we use scanning beam and something called apertures. And I'm going to spend more time on that later in my talk. But scanning beam proton therapy is the ability to put precise spots of protons all along the tumor target and to actually modulate the intensity of those spots so that you can adjust the dose within that target. And then when you add these brass apertures, they're very large pieces of brass to the sides of these beams, you can create a super sharp edge which we'll talk about in a little bit. But that super sharp edge allows us to escalate radiotherapy dose most safely. And an example, for instance, is like this gentleman that I treated. We were able to escalate radiotherapy dose to that clival area, the tumor target, and skim right off that brainstem. And that's what we're trying to accomplish, is to try to land that golf ball in the, uh, on the green without getting into the fair, uh, into the Sand traps. As you know, I don't, I, I don't play golf, so it's hard for me to make this analogy, so just, just bear with me. So, well, it turns out in this excellent, well-done meta-analysis, radio surgery and SBRT also improves outcomes relative to conventional radiotherapy. But proton therapy at 10 years has a better outcome than radio surgery and, and stereotactic body radiotherapy. And why is that the case? Well, this is the, part of the largest series of gamma knife radio surgery for clival chordomas. It was launched by the uh, Gamma Knife Foundation. And it's a really interesting paper. A uh, number of centers from all across the country tried to pool their data. And it's very impressive when, in looking at the abstract that the, uh, that the control that they expressed at five years was about five, 70% in patients who'd never been treated with radiotherapy. That's actually pretty good. That's very good to see that. But it's also one of those devil in the details type situations. So when we explore the paper a little bit more, what they define as control of the tumor is within that area they treated. But when they account for areas around what they treated, their five-year control is actually 50%. That's, that's low for our standards. That's essentially, if you look at this curve, that's essentially like treating to a very modest dose of radiation. Whereas in protons, we're trying to escalate the dose to get the long-term control higher. So here's an example of a patient uh, that was referred to me who was treated with gamma knife surgery twice. And the, after the first time, he, it came back outside of what he was treated. And then after the second time, two years later, it came back outside of what he was treated. And this is challenging. This speaks to this principle we talked about of microskip mets and the infiltrative nature of this tumor and the need to treat a little bit more broadly. So this is a patient I treated, never been radiated before, had a very good surgery. Uh, we treat broadly. We treat to the, not just to uh, the surgical bed, but areas up against the brain stem. We treat broadly along the basis sphenoid bilaterally to, because of the infiltrative nature of the tumor. And Dr. Walensky mentioned something about an intralesional resection, the idea that when we, in a clival resection, we go into the tumor, and as we're pulling out, it's not uncommon that this tumor can seed areas of, uh, that's coming out, and we need to treat that area too because we can, we can see tumor grow in that area. But then we use the sharp edges of the Beam to escalate to the highest risk area to try to get that the highest dose. And that's the, the approach that protons affords. So we were using terms earlier about PFS and OS and stuff. So let me just define. For, for PFS is called progression-free survival. It counts uh, both survival and progression, like growth of tumor. What I found interesting about this paper is it speaks to an endpoint of survival, uh, which is the timeline. We want to create long-term chordoma survivors. And what I think is really important that this paper speaks to is the importance of radiotherapy approach to providing long-term survivorship for our chordoma patients. And why is that? And I think this was mentioned in some of the prior talks, that the upfront treatment 
of Cordoma is super, super critical. You all know that, that it's important to have the best possible surgery and the best possible radiotherapy because if the tumor does come back, it proves very challenging to manage. And as Dr. Stoop and Dr. Park will mention, some of our medical therapies not as effective as we would like to. So, uh, and as in addition, when the tumor comes back, it has a potential to spread elsewhere. Uh, so it's really important that we uh, prom uh, ensure that we get the best possible surgery and the best possible radiotherapy. And as a radiation oncologist, you know, we treat a lot of chordomas at the Northwestern Proton Center. My job when I see a patient is to say, uh, first, do I think you've had enough surgery? And it is not uncommon that I will pick up the phone and I'll call the surgeon who referred the patient and say, I think they need sur more surgery. And they'll say, I'm not sure I can handle that. And that's when I call Dr. Walensky and Dr. Chandler and say, hey guys, can you help out? And let's do this in a multidisciplinary way. But the future advances lie, in my opinion, on doing better up front. The better we can do up front when a patient is first diagnosed and managed, then the less likely we are to have a recurrence and the longer we are to prolong their time as chordoma survivors. So how do we do that? So there are continued improvements in, in proton therapy. So here's again that target that we're trying to treat and we're trying to sharpen our edge. So we talked, so here's a target that we're trying to treat and here's an organ at risk. We'll say the spinal cord for a spinal tumor. And we, these yellow structures are what we call those brass apertures that give us a sharp edge. And when we treat with protons, we're essentially delivering spots of proton therapy into the target and using two different beams in this case. The challenge becomes when we have the aperture edge right here, we get a little cold on that, on that treatment plan right next to the organ at risk. So what we used to have to do is open up that aperture to try to make sure we get sufficient dose to this part of the target even when we're right on the edge. But then we actually spill a little bit more dose into that organ at risk that is so critical. And that's not what we want to accomplish. So a major advance that we've had over the last several years is the ability to uh, bring spot scanning protons with uh, uh, apertures and a software, what we call Monte Carlo, to be able to model those protons as they go right along that aperture, bounce off of it and into various tissues. And then what we can do is then we can intensify those spots right along the edge and therefore fill in the dose to what we want to achieve without having to open up the aperture. My humble bias is this is one of the greatest advances we've had in radiation oncology in a long time, to sharpen this edge, because we're now able to treat much more safely than I could seven years ago when we were treating with protons. So this is a really important uh, step forward. So here's an example of a patient I treated uh, after surgery. So we brought in a beam from one end, mixed it with another beam, from, this, from the left lateral end and then brought another beam and all of it together, each one with a sharp edge, led to a very high dose escalation to that target and really trying to skim off uh, the organs at risk. So I've been fortunate to have been involved with, uh, to lead several national clinical trials through the NCI on radiotherapy approaches. I have not achieved the same success as Dr. Stoop in being able to change practice, but we've had some exciting findings. But this is a trial that I designed and wrote about five years ago. It was a trial designed to see for a primary brain tumor called glioblastoma, can we escalate radiation dose more safely using proton therapy? So why am I talking about glioblastoma at a Cordoma conference? Well, this trial is still accruing, and we anticipate anticipate results next year. But irrespective of whatever the results of this trial, one of the greatest benefits of this trial will be over the long term. Our capacity and ability to unite all, if not the vast majority of all proton centers under one cooperative clinic group clinical trial structure called the Energy Oncology, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. So these are several of the proton centers. I'm not naming them all. But they all enrolled on this study, and they all continue to enroll on proton studies. And they're allowing us, and this is a phenomenal opportunity because we get to con uh, collect uh, tissue centrally. We get to do quality assurance of the treatment plans. We get to create some uniformity about how we all treat. So this becomes a really important idea. And so we're working with Dr. Park, who's going to be speaking later, using some of his very novel uh, radiation sensitizer data to try to bring that out into a multi-institution trial that spans the US to try to crew quicker, crew to a larger phase trial, and generate better data uh, in the process. So that's exciting. So um, 
I actually don't live downtown. I live in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, and it's just because I have little kids and I need a backyard. But uh, we practice out in uh, at the Proton Center. Uh, this was this morning. It took me 41 minutes to get into, uh, into the city. Um, but at our center, uh, not only do we have the Proton Center, we have a full-fledged cancer center with several tools and technology, gamma knife radio surgery, spine SBRT, and proton therapy. Uh, my wonderful and talented colleague, Dr. Sachdev, is going to speak about the role of radio surgery. Uh, but it really is leveraging the entire toolbox in radiotherapy to manage these patients. I thank you all for your time and attention. I'm happy to address questions at the end of the speaker. Thank you, Benai. That was fantastic. So now we're going to hear from Sean Sachdev. So, um, you know, many of you have had experience with proton beam, but not everybody has access to proton beam. So stereotech radio surgery has been uh, thought of as a potential alternative. But also people that have had proton beam therapy have also had an experience with kind of a combination of two because with some of the hardware placements that we have, you just can't get proton beam through all, all this metal that we put in your body. So. There's different things that need to be thought of, and so I'm going to uh, pass that over to Sean to talk more about stereotactic radio surgery and its role. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here um, to talk to you all today. Um, uh, you've heard from Dr. Gandhi about uh, fractionated particle or proton therapy. I'm going to briefly introduce you to another tool in the radiation oncology um, toolbox, and that is uh, stereotactic radio surgery. Um, as you know, uh, radiotherapy is commonly delivered in a fractionated manner, by which I mean that we're giving a small daily doses to the tumor. And if you've ever wondered why that is, why don't we just treat the tumor all at once with you know, all the dose that we have to give? Well, we know from uh, you know, classic experimental studies of radiobiology that at a certain fractional dose, uh, radiation has a different effect on tumor and normal tissue. And what we found is that when we are at the lower end of the dose of uh, uh, fractional spectrum, uh, uh, giving lower doses per fraction, we tend to cause more damage to tumor as opposed to normal tissue. So this is a graph, and I I'll promise I'm not going to get into too much nerdy radiobiology, but this is a graph, if you were to, if you were to consider the y-axis, basically showing um, what percentage of cells survive a certain dose of radiation per fraction. Um, and what you can see is that when you're at a lower, at the lower end of the dose spectrum, you, you're preferentially damaging tumor cells more than normal tissue, okay? So let's say if you give a small fractional dose, more of the tumor cells die, less survive on this y-axis, whereas you preserve normal tissue. And if you, can, if you continue to increase the dose, that difference goes away. And frankly, if you continue to increase the, the dose to very high levels, you may actually get to a point where you're damaging more normal tissue as opposed to tumor cells. So the purpose, the goal, the intent of fractionated radiotherapy is to continue to preserve this part of the curve and you want to extend it out. And by giving daily uh, smaller fractions, you continue to maintain a separation of the curve. You continue to cause more damage to fractionated tissue, excuse me, more damage to, to tumor tissue in a fractionated approach while protecting the normal tissue. And with each fraction of radiotherapy, you're causing tumor cell DNA damage by oxidative stress as well as uh, cell cycling. And you're preserving normal tissue by allowing repair in between uh, treatment fractions. And you're allowing, in certain cases, normal tissues to repopulate. Um, but what if you had the capability to exactly deposit dose right on the tumor without worrying about spillover dose to the normal tissue? If you could do that, you could then give very high doses per fraction to the tumor and not have to worry about the, the damaging effect on nearby normal structure. One of the advantages of doing this, and this is under uh, you know, intense study right now in our field, if you go to very, very high doses per fraction, not only are you causing tumor cell DNA damage, you're also actually inducing tumor aggression through other mechanisms of tumor cell kill, including changes to the tumor vasculature and the tumor stroma. So if you have the capability to do this and if you can damage the tumor singularly without worrying about spillover dose to normal tissue, that is essentially what radiosurgery is. Radiosurgery has a combination of the words radiation and surgery, 
is the capability to use an, a high energy focus to treat both intracranial and extracranial lesions. Now, if you go through literature, if you go and read through data from a certain center, uh, historically, the nomenclature has been that if we're using radiosurgery in the brain, that's called stereotactic radiosurgery, and if we're using the same technology or very similar technology outside the brain, extracranially, that's often called stereotactic ablative body radiation, SABER, which is a cool acronym, or SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy. Treatment when we're using radiosurgery is usually in one, but it can be up to five fractions. Um, it is ideally suited for ab ablation of small, well-defined targets, building on what Dr. Gunn Gandhi said, it is not optimally suited, although there is some extent to cover microscopic disease, it's not optimally suited to liberally cover uh, you know, uh, uh, a large extent of tissue around an area of concern for fully covering microscopic spread. It's something that uh, uses um, advanced image guidance and a high dose perfraction again for ablation. Let's practically consider where radiosurgery began in the brain uh, with the gamma knife, uh, which can be conceptually thought of as a wheel. Okay, if you were to imagine a wheel with eight spokes, um, and if each of the spokes were electrified, all delivering current to central hub, what if you started adding thinner and thinner spokes? So you went from eight thicker spokes to 16 thinner spokes, each now contributing a little bit more current to the hub. Then you go to 32, you go to 64, 128, so on and so forth, and then you ultimately get to 192 spokes, all contributing dose to a central hot point. And that is essentially how the gamma knife works. Um, now, this is, a, this is an oversimplification in terms of the physics because we're not accounting for the individual beamlet dose deposition as it traverses through the tissue, but it's a good conceptual way to think about the fact that you have 192 teeny beamlets that all come together at one central point to create a hot spot, which is called the isocenter or the shot. And the way the gamma knife essentially works is with sheer tactical localization and some millimeter accuracy, you are essentially painting in the tumor with these hot spots. You're essentially punching holes in the tumor with a very, very powerful, essentially something akin to radioactive laser. What about the other common radiosurgery platform that you've seen uh, from, from institutions and, and in the literature, the cyber knife? Um, if any of you have driven a car manufactured within the past 20 years, there's a pretty good chance that it was manufactured on an assembly line using robots. One of the most popular types of car manufacturing robots is a Cooper robot, uh, which is created by a German company shown here in red. And essentially what the cyber knife is, in case you didn't know, is a high-end KUKA robot uh, comprising the majority of the machine. So basically this is a KUKA robot here, the robotic arm, which has attached to it a compact linear accelerator positioned above an orthogonal imaging panel, which is used for live patient movement tracking. Um, this is uh, an early prototype of the cyber knife as it was being developed in the 1990s. Um, and this is um, basically another picture of the robot in the same orientation, you can see this is a very nice paint job uh, for, for the cyber knife. Um, basically, the goal here is very similar to the gamma knife. The one subtle difference is that as opposed to all the beamlets being on simultaneously in the gamma knife, here you're creating a hot spot uh, by using individual beamlets, um, and then you're repeating the process to move that hot spot throughout the three dimensional span of the tumor. Um, so this kind of focal beamlet derived treatment with a gamma knife or with a cyber knife is, is one approach uh, to treat a small lesion that's an ideal radiosurgery target. But what if you have a larger lesion? Well now with advanced um, uh, advancements in technology we have the capability to deliver highly conformal um, radiotherapy beams using shape intensity shape and intensity modulation. What does that mean exactly? Well basically it's a capability to shape the tumor very finely. Uh, to the exact sort of the 3D, uh, you know, shape and dimension of the tumor while simultaneously blocking adjacent organs at risk. And now this is basically very commonly found in modern linear accelerators, which are treatment machines that we use, uh, you know, to deliver high energy radiation that are all now computer controlled. So they have the capability to do this. The other component is to use intensity modulation. Well, that simply means that once you've finally shaped your beams to the shape of the tumor, you can now alter the intensity pattern uh, within the beams themselves. So conceptually, one way to think about this is that if you were to think of, um, of, of a beam of light, not only can you shape the focus of that, uh, the, excuse me, the shape, the actual shape of that beam of light, you can, al you can alter the intensity within the light. So you can make, make certain portions of the light brighter or darker. And all of those 
lights uh, with different intensity patterns, beams of lights can come together to create you know, unique shapes that are able to conform to the tumor while sparing normal structures around the tumor. This complex inter interplay of intensity modulated beams is too, too complex for the human mind to actually plan out. So all of these treatments are done with inverse planning, by which a physician like myself will three-dimensionally very carefully spend hours to define the target that needs to be treated and define what needs to be protected. And then using a very powerful computer, looking at millions of different beam arrangements, we'll, we'll figure out how to vary the intensity of all the different beams to create that dose distribution. What if you could go one step further? What if you could increase the resolution of this treatment from a, from a few beams to hundreds of beams around the patient delivered continuously like a major arc? And that is the, the, the latest, uh, uh, basically, version of intensity modulated treatment, um, uh, which not only allows us to treat patients very quickly, it gives us immense latitude to essentially be able to paint the dose where we want it to go. And here are a few examples of patients who are treated with this kind of a technology where we're able to very beautifully carve the dose right on the tumor while staying off important structures such as the spinal, spinal canal and of course the spinal cord, the parotid glands here, and here's a patient um, who was treated and you can see that we, we've, we've created a, basically a safe tunnel for the optic structures to be able to pass through safely while still giving as much high dose as we can to the surrounding areas. Um, using this kind of, uh, you know, this set of modern techniques, we're now able to do safely uh, single fraction radio surgery treatments in very, very critical areas such as the skull base and what's relevant for us today, uh, the spine. Here's an example of a patient with a metastatic lesion extending posteriorly from the vertebral body going uh, uh, sort of uh, backwards uh, through the pedicle. Um, and this is a single fraction radio surgery treatment. And what's important is that this is theoretically potentially a very dangerous treatment. If you were to consider this being the spinal cord, these two colors represent the dose distributions that are safe for the spinal cord, but if you go any deeper than the red arrow, you can actually cause... Uh, If you go any deeper um, than that red arrow, you're actually at a dose level as you get closer and closer to the target here, as shown in the dark red, uh, where, where those doses are actually technically not safe for the spinal cord. So as you can imagine, doing this kind of a very potentially dangerous treatment requires uh, you know, very precise immobilization. And so what we use is a, uh, basically a robotic hexapod. Uh, patient treatment position system. It's called a hexapod because it has six degrees of freedom. You can go up and down, left to right, in and out, uh, roll. You can adjust the roll, the rotation of the patient's axis, uh, pitch, and then yaw. And if all of those sound familiar to anyone in the audience, if we have a pilot in the audience, those are the exact positional controls that are used in aviation. So once we are able to very finely position the patient and the target to within a millimeter and less than a degree of uh, uh, being off rotation, uh, then, then the treatment is ready to begin. Um, at Northwestern, we use this uh, patient immobilization system called the Body Fix by a company called Medical Intelligence, now um, owned by Electa. Um, and basically, here is a, you know, a, a 3D depiction of a treatment, of a single fraction radio surgery treatment. And all these different hash marks represent 182 steps of uh, shape and beam modulation to very focally deliver, like a radioactive laser, the dose exactly where it needs to go. Um, so, if, uh, as Dr. Gandhi briefly mentioned this, this is one of the largest experiences that's been reported in, in the use of um, uh, radio surgery for the treatment of chordomas. This is from the North American uh, Gamma Knife Consortium, which is actually a consortium of a lot of, uh, of a large number of institutions. But in this report, six institutions contributed, five from the United States and one from the Canada, uh, reporting the outcomes of uh, treating skull-based chordomas with radio surgery for 71 patients. It was a heterogeneous group, so about 50% uh, of the patients were treated for either e uh, for re-radiation in a previously uh, treated site or for a recurrence. The median dose was 15 gray in a single fraction, although the range was large, going from 9 to 25 gray, and that was most certainly dictated by how close the target was to an important area of risk, an important area that needed to be protected. And that, that dosing led to a five-year local control rate of about 
66%. Uh, the authors did do a nice job of trying to figure out what were the factors that were associated with local control. One of the factors was tumor volume, and tumor volume is, again, inversely associated with how much dose you can safely give. Um, and the most important factor on multivariate analysis was the, which is not shocking in a histology like Chordoma, was the, was the dose that was delivered, very radio-resistant histology. And what they found was that if you could get at least a marginal dose of 15 gray to the entirety of the tumor, you had a much better local control than if the doses were lower than that. Uh, one institution that's really tried to push um, uh, the dose to these lesions and has really tried to investigate this as a potential future modality for Chordoma treatment is the group from Sloan Kettering with Dr. Bilski, Dr. Yamada, Dr. Lawfer. Um, and they initially reported um, uh, their results of a large cohort of patients in 2013. 24 patients, three of whom had metastatic lesions, six had recurrent lesions. All patients were treated to a very, very potent dose of 24 gray in a single uh, fraction. And uh, you know, very impressive results. Only one patient progressed of all the patients that were treated. However, which is a very important caveat, the follow-up was only, the median follow-up was only two years. So it's important that, you know, that we always keep that in mind. We have to have enough adequate time to vent data before we can fully endorse uh, a treatment. Interestingly, 13 of the patients were treated preoperatively with radiation for, and were set to undergo planned surgery. Seven of those, of those patients avoided surgery. You know, the authors described that this was inclusive of patient preference, and we don't really have the details of how much those lesions actually regressed or, or were controlled. And, I'm, I, you know, we were eagerly waiting for an update on this series. The authors did present, uh, the group from Sloan Kettering did present a smaller cohort of patients in 2017, 12 patients who had at least six months of follow-up, all underwent separation surgery, which is basically debunking the lesion close to the spinal cord to give more room for radiosurgery. Um, and six of those patients underwent uh, treatment for you know, non-recurrent uh, lesions, and only five of those six had lengthy follow-up. And of those five, uh, four remained free of progression. So 80% local control, while that's a good number, uh, you know, again, we're only dealing with five patients. I think that's the caveat of this approach. So then the question is, can we use radiosurgery for chordomas? The answer is yes, but it needs further study. Just based on how this treatment is delivered, very focally radioablative, it is ideally suited for lesions that are metastatic or recurrent or in a previously radiated field, uh, but we certainly need more, um, more investigation and, uh, and, and further time to event data. Um, uh, uniquely, radiosurgery, given its uh, unique radiobiologic impact on tumors, is well suited for combinatorial approaches and, and, and research questions. Here's an early phase trial that's being, being, uh, being conducted at Johns Hopkins uh, with Song Kettering looking at uh, uh, potentially combining immunotherapy um, with uh, radiosurgery in patients with recurrent advanced or metastatic lesions. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll, I'll end quickly here. Uh, you know, these are complex lesions that require a multidisciplinary team-based approach. We're fortunate to have Dr. Walensky here with his surgical expertise. And, 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 and you know, now with radiosurgery, we have yet another tool that we can use um, against chordomas. And our mission is to continue to study uh, this modality and to use it for our patients' benefit. I'd like to thank the Cordoma Foundation, our patients, importantly, who, who, who teach us quite a lot, um, as well as my colleagues who truly dedicate themselves to excellent patient service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Sorry to cut you off short because yeah, no, sure. Jim and I used up all your time. But Roger's got to get a flight, so we're going to have Roger Stoop uh, talk to us about oh, what's really important in the future because I think that uh, surgery and... Um, Radio surgery or radiation therapy is pretty barbaric. We're getting better and better at it, but really the key is going to be, can we give something different to treat you guys so that you don't have to have anything that we offer? So Roger, I'll give you Thank the... you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and I apologize in advance that I can't stay for the whole day. I'm competing with a business event of my wife out in New York, and so it was either my private life or my career, so uh, I had to make choices. Um, but it's actually easier. It would be okay. Can you please talk about state of the art? No. What is the state of the art? There is no state of the art when it comes to medical treatments. Um, and it, I could stop here and say, okay, have a good day. I catch my flight. Um, 
And it's exactly the situation I've been in 2005 when I got to see and treat the first Chordoma patients. Nobody knew what to do. And when they didn't know anymore what to do, then they sent them over for medical treatment. And I want to change the thinking about that. Why medical treatment? We heard excellent talks on surgery. We take the excellent talks on radiation, sharpening the edge, uh, beautifully put. But the tumor is not always keeping a sharp edge and is infiltrating. There are cells left behind. There are cells that we can not see, that is invisible. And that's where what we call medical treatment, chemotherapy, th systemic treatment comes to play um, to actually get, go after this invisible tumor. So in 2005, and coming from Switzerland, so you, uh, a country, so we had about six cordoma um, per year in the whole country, uh, and this divided in 26 states. So you can imagine how much a single physician has an experience. Um, so I was reaching out to other colleagues in Europe and uh, was then actually teaming up with my Italian colleagues. It's 10 times larger. And we did this study with uh, Imaginate, one of those new targeted molecules going according to one of those kinases, these targeting agents that would signal the tumor to grow. And uh, we're looking in the tumor tissue that we had from initial surgery, whether they had expressed a certain receptor. We then uh, came up with some results and actually very well published and somewhat overstated, saying, oh, there's a good majority of patients who have had stable disease. That's probably not good enough. It made it into guidelines and so on. And uh, we get these survival curves. And you've seen all kind of these survival curves already today. But of course, you always need to look, what are, are they measuring? But the question is not always only what we're measuring. What's the difference between these patients who actually will die within a few months, while others will live and live progression free five, 10 years later, okay? trying to understand that and see what's wrong. And why can't we really treat those tumors? They are slow growing, but other tumors we actually have been fairly successful in, uh, uh, in treating. We have tested multiple molecules, and we have now more molecules coming out than a single oncologist can keep track of. When I trained, there was not a single molecule coming to the market that I did not have experience with as it was researching it. Now there are molecules out by people. Uh, my colleagues say they're treating with what? And I said, why well, have to look up first what it is? Because we don't uh, see uh, the, the, them all anymore. And still, the curves always look the same. Let me try to bring you to thinking why uh, certain things will not make sense. You go to NCCN guidelines, this kind of you know, holy grail, what should be standard, which is basically not one stoop who doesn't know, but 10 stoops who don't know, uh, sitting around the table and come up with the best state of the error. And you find all these agents on there. What you also find is that actually this comes way after everything else has been done. So we're talking not about the same tumor that Dr. Walensky has uh, done surgery on 10 years earlier. And Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Sashdev has done beautiful, very targeted radiation possibly repeatedly, and everything has had its value. But it's a different tumor, it's a different beast that has been resistant to all of that. Just to show you that uh, we need to change the thinking, you know, even though it says the guidelines are from 2019, I'm not sure the laser is working, but the last update for Cordoma in medical treatment dates back from 2013. Okay. So something needs to change. I mentioned that it's not the same tumor, it's a resistant tumor. The tumor we treat, when I treat all the way down the line, is a tumor that is in a different environment, fairly resistant to everything. It doesn't even have the same or the sufficient vascularization, vascular bed. So the drugs I give may not even get to the tumor in sufficient quantities. So my treatment may be the right one. 
But if it doesn't get to the tumor, it uh, will not uh, be able to have an effect. So, at the same time, we get case reports who actually talk about success. Here an example with standard old chemotherapy with a complete response on a metastasis. Oh, a tumor that is not in the same local environment that was multiply treated, but in a complete different environment. And here the drugs got to the tumor and it was going away. Whether this is the reason or not, or whether for this exception, I cannot tell you. I just want to bring you to that we need to change uh, the way we think as we move forward. We need to think different, and we need to think different also in the way we do the sequencing, especially as we want to develop new, better treatments. And rather than waiting with the systemic treatment all the way to the end, maybe bring it up front Bring it up front in the window when you have a waiting time until you do the first surgery and see whether a drug can have an effect and when you do the surgery, uh, you can actually look whether the tumor is there, whether the target was hit and you could continue with the treatment. If it's not before the surgery, before the radiation, I don't want to say before one or the other, but I think we need to talk together up front and sometimes have new concepts how we approach a problem um, if we want to really make progress. And we have made some progress. And Dr. Park will talk about Bracuri and will look about agents that are novel, that have been identified by genetically analyzing the tumors up front and, and each time during the uh, process as we repeat uh, biopsies and do surgery again. And have randomized trials, and there are now randomized trials ongoing, and you will hear later about it. Nobody can take as an oncologist a podium these days without talking about immunotherapy. Now, this is on one side a hype, but there's also true hope in there. There are new approaches, and yes, our immune system, if it can recognize what is foreign, and if it can recognize the tumor as foreign, may actually act. And there are case reports. Now, if we would, in theory, analyze whether it should work, chordoma are not the best tumor um, to consider for immunotherapy. But looking at what is uh, been out in the literature, these are friends of mine who have done this case report. And actually, there are three cases of immunotherapy with somewhat amazing or su somewhat surprising responses that had a few months of duration, very well documented. That should at least intrigue us to also integrate that modality as we continue with the thinking for uh, chordoma or think completely outside the box. And uh, Dr. Gandhi is smiling because, of course, I had to bring that. He brought all the technology. I have also to have my gadget on technology. Um, this is tumor treating fields. Uh, outside the box thinking of actually treating cancer with alternating electrical fields. That means if we are even here in the city, when there is high power lines, you would, would put the bulb up, it would light up because there is tension, there's energy there. And this energy, if you focus it on biological process, on cells where we have a lot of polar molecules, you can interfere with cell division. Uh, that's the spindle apparatus, what you need when one cell is growing and dividing into two. We have taken that with a device into the clinic in glioblastoma in brain cancer where we put electrodes on the patient's head and have it then linked to a, a device. But what keeps us, and we're discussing with Dr. Walensky to develop such a thing with implants he has to put in anyhow when he does the surgery, and then through those implants having electrical tension, these electrical fields applied uh, long term to the tumor. So in summary, what I wanted to tell you, there is no state of the art, and I think I don't have to tell you that's why you are in the Cardoma Foundation and you're coming to the big center. And I think that's what we're trying uh, to do, to collaborate, to think outside the box. 
We need to make sure that the patients who are newly diagnosed get to see the experts early on and not down the line when we have to repair to do them. The first treatment choices has to be a strategy, including a strategy what you say, if it fails, what would be the next line you would do? This is a general concept. Taking into account, of course, tumor control, quality of life, burden of disease, all the other factors which those curves, those survival curves we tend to show, do not necessarily reflect. I showed you that we somewhat treat blindly with an agent the best we have, but it's not necessarily reaching the tumor, and we don't know whether the tumor is the right, has the right receptors for it. We have overall slow-growing tumors. So one of the better things of the biology of a cardoma is that it's rarely an emergency that I, have to, that I see the patient on Friday and no later than Monday we have to do something. So there is the time for reflection, there is the time to try a new avenue without necessarily uh, putting the patient at risk to really long-term improve outcome. And I said that we need to work in collaboration, there is synergy between radiation and medical treatments, uh, integrate all disciplines from the beginning, and hopefully next time, or maybe it takes five years, that I'll start today rather than read the last one of the first session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Roger. That was fantastic. It's very inspirational to make us think about what the future has. And now uh, Derek's going to come up and talk, right? Or are you talking this afternoon? I think you're talking. Okay, so Derek, I'm going to introduce Derek a little bit too. So Derek, the world's lying in funny ways. So Derek and I met each other at one of the first uh, Cordoma conferences back at the NIH, I don't know, 2008, one of those two, seven, I don't know, somewhere around there. And Derek was, is a neuro-oncologist and was dragged into the Cordoma world by Josh, and maybe Josh's mom. I'm not really sure exactly which one of them dragged you into the world of Cordoma. Together together, because they're very persistent, motivated people. And so he took on Cordoma at that time, not really knowing what he was getting into. And then he, his world came from Pennsylvania and eventually got to the NIH in, in DC. And then my wife wanted me to come out to Chicago because she wanted a bigger city than being in Baltimore at Hopkins. And Derek's wife wanted him to be in Chicago because his wife is from here. And so we found each other here. Uh, just down the street, but it allows us to have a collaboration that's, you know, reaches across different campuses throughout the city in this Midwest area. And so Derek's going to talk a little bit now, and we're going to have a panel of discussion, and then he's going to talk a little bit later about the future of Cordoma and trials and things like that. So I know we're behind schedule. I'm going to make it really short. I'm going to give you guys a break. I, the state of the art, um, I agree with uh, what Roger said. There is no state of the art. And um, unfortunately, it's a disease that's treated by surgery and radiation. Um, medical therapies have failed. As you know, there's nothing that's approved by the FDA for this disease. So I'm going to talk about current research at a later time. I'm going to break uh, because there is no state of the art. Okay, thank you.